Recording in progress.
Buenas tardes, hermanas. Espero que estemos con fuerza renovada. Aquí. Good morning. Here we have in our link, in our screen, the link to look at the documents for Dropbox. So please remember, you need to put the letters the same as you can see here with the capitals and with the normal letters. Remember, otherwise the link will not work. So here again is the link where you can see the documents that our speakers gave us and that has been given, have been given over these few days. So you can copy this link and paste it in the same way. Entrar. So you copy it so that you can uh, enter with the uh, lower caps, small caps and uh, Otro anuncio antes de empezar. Another announcement before we begin. Have you seen an iPhone with an orange cover? It was it was lost. I mean, it was left. I mean, they, they can't find it. And they left it in the dining room. So please, if you help us find this phone. Another announcement is that when we leave the room for breaks or for meals, please do not leave your phones on the table, please. We have uh, no control over whatever is left on the table. Thank you. Les pedimos que vuelvan a su lugar. We ask you please to go back to your seats. And we have Monsignor Carballo already here with us. Yolanda, 
Yolanda already introduced them. We've uh, had him with me and thank you for the Eucharist that we celebrated with him. Now we're going to listen to him on the topic of uh, formation. Synodality, uh, implications for formation. We thank Monsignor Carballo for his presence and we stay in this attitude of listening and we give ourselves time to continue taking into our heart whatever the spirit is telling us. So thank you, Monsignor Carballo, for being with us and you have the floor. Good afternoon, sisters. I was uh, told that what matters is not the content, rather to not allow you to fall asleep. So I'm going to speak as I always do, so that you don't fall asleep. Whatever I say is not doesn't matter that much. I was asked to tell you about synodality, rather formation in a synodal key. And as I saw the program that uh, about what you dealt with these days, I honestly have uh, little, little or nothing to add. I'm just going to throw out some ideas that may be more or less useful. So allow me to greet you once again. All of you, it's really a pleasure for me to see you all gathered here. This could be a cenacle where you might come out of, uh, as well as all the consecrated life you represent to announce that Christ is alive and is present amongst us. So formation and synodality, two words, two terms uh, that uh, enlighten each other we cannot, uh, in my opinion, we cannot think about a synodal process without an appropriate formation. And you cannot think of uh, formation and, uh, no, formation in and for consecrated life that is not synodal. If uh, the church is a synodal by nature, we can affirm that the formation uh, process is also by nature synodal. It is called to involve in that process all the people and institutions as possible. On the other hand, the synodal process includes or requires a formation that opens the individual to the community, or rather the individual becomes aware of uh, his or her belonging to the holy people of God. And it has to open up this person to a series of uh, relations that lead uh, him or her to live uh, life in a following of Christ with plenitude. If, as the Pope says, and I quote, synodality is the path that God expects of the Church of the Third Millennium, if synodality, if synodality is the modus vivendi and operandi of the Church, and if the church is uh, marked by walking together, we can say the same about formation. We cannot speak of formation without considering the synodal feature, the synodal interpretation. If we do not take into account the need to walk together, 
the people information, and I'm not only referring to initial formation, rather permanent formation, ongoing formation as well. Formators or accompaniers, uh, the formation community, and if uh, possible, the holy people of God. If in exercising, uh, if, if uh, the vocation of the human person is concentrated in the exercise of synodality, living the community in, this, in an honest gift of oneself and in union with God and with uh, the brothers, also in the same formation for consecrated life, uh, the ultimate objective is to um, ensure that this person can walk with the others until reaching a communion with God. If the synodal process aims at a change of a mindset and structures in the life of the church, the formation process in a synodal key also aims at changing the mindset and the hearts of people in formation. That is why we can uh, apply to formation what uh, St. John uh, uh, Chrysostom says about the church. Synodon is, is a name, is his name, name of the church, name of formation. The, not the church with, uh, without synodality nor formation without that same dimension church and formation are synodal by nature. I'm uh, now going to read in parallel some characteristics about synodality. And uh, in light of that, some characteristics that the formation process should um, include. Firstly, synod and formation are a process. The word that accompanies both synod and formation is process. Process, which means movement that leads to a change, to a transformation in people and structures. As far as a synod, it is about a change or transformation of the situation that the church is undergoing, often dominated by clericalism, that not all, only happens among men, but also among women. The Pope speaks of clericalism of the skirts. Going from that clericalism to a new situation where the church sees itself as a people of God. That is the ecclesiological inheritance left by Vatican II, ecclesiology of the people of God. It's also about a uh, passage, a transformation from a pyramidal structure where some uh, command and the others obey, some teach, the others learn, to go to a vision in circles whose, uh, whose center displays Jesus, where Jesus is at the center and where all rely on uh, the vocation they've been called to. As far as formation, it is a process that starting with the reality of every person, be careful with this formation that does uh, that is not based on the reality of a person is not formation, it is deformation. Leading that person based on his or her concrete situation, not the ideal one, to assimilate the feelings of Christ for the Father, as John Paul II says in Vite Consacrata. That's how he defines the formation process. That's why I open a parenthesis from the uh, document I have. The first requirement in formation is that the person has to know him or herself. 
Otherwise, the entire building is just uh, built on sand. And the gospel says that we have to build on a firm rock and not on sand. That is why many times we're going to have to take down, take apart the ideal I, the ideal self. Oftentimes the poetic uh, I that is filled with poetry and uh, replace it with the real I, the real self. Formation is a process that, as the apostle said, leads the person in formation to reach the level of Christ, the stature of Christ. A process, again, uh, quoting uh, uh, Paul, that leads the person to break away with the old man, to be born again, to be born into a new man. As a consequence, That transformation entails to go from the logic of the world, what the Pope identifies as worldliness, to the logic of the gospel, from a logic that is based on having to a logic based on the being. It uh, entails a passage from the logic of appropriation. Be careful, we are very much into this, uh, to appropriate ourselves, not just of ideas, but also people, to a logic of the gift of giving oneself. Therefore, a logic of, uh, of uh, depriving ourselves. And it entails also to go from a logic dominated by flesh to a logic dominated by the spirit. About formation, we can also say what we said about the church, if both church and formation do not begin a deep transformation of people and institutions, both the synod and formation will simply putting some makeup on just changing their image with no deep changes. And we have to be careful, be careful to not just aim at hiding our wrinkles. The transformation we are asked for is deep. Formation is a process aimed at changing the life of people, just as the synod has to tend to change the life of the church, thereby also people. In both cases, it's about a process of a true and deep conversion. If a young person completes the formation process as he or she began it, please do not grant him or her a profession. You will be avoiding problems that will show up. If there's been no evolution, that person never entered a formation process. Perhaps uh, a process uh, of uh, doctrine, of learning the doctrine, but not formation, and that's very different. Therefore, both the synod as formation are slow processes that require time and patience and nowadays even more. That is why please, please do not ask the congregation for a dispensation of uh, novitiate time. Do not rush, do not skip stages. They're old, is because they're older, or precisely sometimes older people need a longer formation process because many of them are already formed beforehand. Be careful with this. These are slow processes 
that require time and a lot of patience. A formator who is not patience cannot be a formator, even if he or she has all the necessary titles and certificates. And in, in the in the synod and in the formation, no stages can be burnt or skipped, and we cannot uh, we cannot rush into collecting the fruits. The gospel here can also teach us something. Some sow or plant. We had to sow. If the seed is good, others will have to collect the fruits. Therefore, keep this in mind. Formation is a process. It's a path. They're simply, they're not just the stages that you need to overcome in order to reach perpetual profession or priestly ordination in the case of men. The characteristics of this process. The first characteristic in my view is will, a will to walk and to walk together. The pandemic, as uh, the Pope reminds us, uh, told us, taught, taught us that nobody can be saved alone. And this brings huge consequences for consecrated life. I always say there's no institute that is so rich, so rich, so rich charismatically to not need the contribution of others. There's no institute that is so poor, so poor, so poor charismatically that has nothing to have, nothing to give. We all need to receive and we can all and should all give something. We're all on the same boat. Something similar is the patrimony that uh, we received from the events that we are experiencing that uh, Pope Francis calls, calls a sacrilegious war. The situation that we experience calls us uh, to walk together, knowing that uh, if the synod is unthinkable without the participation of all the members of God's people, from the last one baptized to the highest hierarchy, formation is also unthinkable without the participation of, of all those who are called to participate in that process. And these are the people in formation. Be careful with those uh, formies who are so obedient and so good that they feel spectators in their own formation. These need to be awakened. We need to wake them up because there's something hiding there that is concealing something. For me, this is a discernment criterion. Therefore, participation of all the people in formation, formators or accompaniers, and be careful with those formators who are alone, who walk alone. That is the that is grounds to create dependency, and dependency should never happen in consecrated life. There's only one dependency because that makes us free, and that is dependency on Jesus. Never sometimes. We hear, I've heard it many times. Hey, look, formation turned out great for me because after so many years, uh, what's his name or X, Y, Z calls me in order before doing anything. And I tell them that's been a total failure. That created a dependency. Allow, allow let, let us allow for me is, uh, to be protagonists in their lives. And we should be very careful about the formators who think that they are all, that they are everything. And then the formation communities. Today, you cannot uh, form in isolation, the formator and the me. No, you need to involve the formation community call it local, provincial, general, because the life 
in an institute, uh, including yours, there are only two types of religious, either formators or deformators. There are no other. And we have to place brothers and sisters uh, before that. What do you want to be, a formator or a deformator? All of this uh, presupposes a will to walk together. You have to conquer the temptation of individualism and the comfort that leads us to situate ourselves. It's time to break away from the logic of it's always been done like this, that is so harmful for the church and consecrated life. And it's uh, about walking. If we want, through the words of Vita Consecrata at number 110, about walking, putting our eyes on the future toward which the Spirit is driving us. If the church, consecrated life and formation, do not want to die suffocated for, from so much self-referentiality, that is another major sin in the consecrated life and in the church today, in an empty appearance of God, as the Pope says, if uh, the church, consecrated life and formation, do, want, do not want to give up before this uh, temptation, they have uh, to place themselves uh, in a position of going forth, knowing that uh, the path is forming and only, and we will find only find God along the path. These are words of the Pope, and only by walking can we face the future. Whereas uh, the being sedentary that in this context uh, is equal to being uh, immobile, just the prevents us from giving many answers to the questions that are arising today. And I'm coming, I come from Santiago de Compostela in the north northwest of Spain. And that makes me think of an image. There where I'm from, there is a cathedral, a sanctuary, a shrine that is, uh, that is visited by many pilgrims. And uh, I was meeting once with the Bishop of Santiago and I was told that Don Julian, I see you're sad today. And he said, I am. And I said, why? Because I just saw a sentence written on the walls of the cathedral, which says, you the priests, but we say with the religious as well, with the bishops, provide answers to questions that nobody asks. And we leave with the existential questions unanswered. Be careful. Do not form for that. Do not form to give uh, answers to questions that nobody that nobody asks. We have to form in order to respond to the questions of today that are being asked by the men and women of today. Please watch uh, about a church that is not walking. Be careful about being uh, unmovable. Be careful and do not repeat expired uh, schemes. Do not form people who refuse to walk or because they think they have arrived at the finish line, either because they think they've arrived at the finish line or because they're afraid of what they cannot control. I'm convinced that uh, at the origin of the fundamentalism that we see in the church, there's a fear of something that we cannot control. We want to control everything. Walk. And walking together. If you go into the internet and you look for Fratelli Tutti, and if you look, you search for the word together, it is the word that is repeated most often to prepare projects together, to dream together, walking together, etc., etc., etc. Together is the word of the future in the church and in formation. Therefore, walk, but walk together. Synodality precisely speaks about that, about walking together. 
the the sin sin that it's that's at the root of sin and it can be understood in a spatial sense like a a place that is shared here we are sharing the same space this meaning can be a useful basis for synodality but it's not enough because we could be seated one next to another but not and not be with the other and not be there for the other that's why i'm saying that we should uh, be watchful of a community life that doesn't bring a fraternity along community yes but it has to be fraternal fraternity yes but in community the sin can also be interpreted as interrelation on a relational affective plan and in a cognitive plan. But this is not enough either. Reducing the sin to this interrelation could lead us to creating a closed groups, sex that there are that exist in the church as well that are well coordinated uh, as far as synergy without reaching an experience of a communion. The synodal dimension in the church and in formation for consecrated life presupposes all of this, but it's not enough. The synodality that we are talking about in the church and formation demands to walk together, maintaining a deep relation in which uh, people in the example of Trinity live in communion, and that has nothing to do with uniformity. There can be a lot of uniformity and not communion. The Father is different from the Son and the Spirit, and it is in the difference that the communion lies. In this sense, this presupposes to walk at uh, the breath of a trinity only when there are trinitarian relations can there be evangelical communion and uh, therefore synodality the experience of a trinitarian god whose unity and communion and inseparable allows us to overcome selfishness to fully place ourselves at the service of the growth of the other and that's what it is about when we speak of the service of authority that is what uh, what formation has to deal with however sisters uh, be watchful of this call to self-formation. This was very trendy a few years ago. Self-formation, be watchful about uh, solitary formators. Self-formation easily leads to individualism or to a, a formation a la carte, as we do when we choose from menus with the uh, difficulty of difficulty to live in a community or or mature the second one would end up in dependencies a lack of maturity and abuse of uh, power on uh, the part of the person that imposes this they both are deforming for consecrated life and very harmful. And I open a parenthesis about abuse of power. Be careful, uh, sisters. This also is a plague in consecrated life. And allow me, I open very openly. The problem of abuse of power occurs especially in feminine institutes. This is a this is something we've noticed and we're receiving a lot of reports of abuse of power that have nothing to do with abuse of authority because authority, if it is genuine, will never lead to abuse of power. And abuse of power is the first step leading to sexual abuse or other types of abuse. Second characteristic of this process, capability to listen. I know that you've heard a lot about this, about listening. There's no synodality without listening. There's no formation without listening. Listening to the people in formation, listening to 
formators and accompaniers listening to the formation community listening as much as possible to other members of the holy people of god and here there's another parenthesis it is not rare that major superior because they have the power should decide to admit a certain person to a profession against the opinion of the formators if the formators if you don't trust the formators withdraw them but if you trust the formators before deciding i know that the code gives you this privilege but before deciding listen there's a reason for the ifs and buts of formators in some cases. It's, uh, it's about uh, mutual listening where everyone has something to learn and at the same time something to give. You listen to the others and all together you listen to the Holy Spirit. It is only in the mutual listening that uh, growth, the growth of people can happen in a discernment that goes beyond personal appreciation. Listening is to make room for the other in my life, taking, take, seriously taking what matters to them. Be careful to the answers we often give. Oh, that doesn't matter. That's not important. Well, that's, that's up to you. That's your opinion. But perhaps it is very important to him or her. We always have to place ourselves in the flesh of the other. Therefore, listening is to make room for the other in my life, seriously considering what is important for them. Ultimately, listening is to make room in our life for the Holy Spirit. Listening is just is not just a matter of the ears, but it is the whole, it involves the whole person, sensitivity, intelligence, affectivity, will. It's about a deep listening, a respectful listening uh, uh, to the person. It is compassionate and has to be participative with no prejudices, with no manipulation. Listening from empathy, allowing ourselves to receive what the other person is saying with a positive uh, disposition and in view to grow that will always help us find that gesture and that appropriate word that will move us from this uh, uh, quiet position of spectators. Let We should not feel as spectators of what is happening in the other person. This uh, listening is an openness, an opening of our heart, and it makes a proximity, proximity possible. And without that, there is no encounter. Information and in this scene, it's about listening to each other, but also about listening to God's voice, distinguishing God's voice from other voices. It's about discerning uh, his will from other wills, including our own. If we do not listen to the other, we do not listen to God either. And um, be watchful about when you're only listening to yourself or only seeks to listen to the music that he or she likes to hear. The listening that we are talking about should be done with confidence, loyalty, humility, and this means that our ego has to be reduced to make room for others. In formation, it is urgent to form companies, and this also applies to general superiors. It is necessary to form formators or companies with the capability to listen. I can tell you from my experience in the dicastery that one of the greatest uh, strategies in consecrated life is loneliness. And many brothers and sisters complain that uh, 
they do not find the people to listen to them. Well, that is your essential ministry. It is the essential ministry of a formator. Another characteristic is accompaniment. Formation as synodality requires accompaniment, which means proximity. Formation is a process where accompaniment is a key factor, and the ones have to feel responsible for the path, for the journey of others. Said the accompaniment that comes from its, uh, the Latin words compagno presupposes to open up to the other, to share our bread of uh, faith, hope, and efforts. And this is a demand for all those who accompany and, and uh, the uh, accompanied. Only in accompaniment uh, can dialogue be possible, a dialogue that is serene, honest, and objective. And if there's no dialogue, well, you just, you can forget it, you will not be forming. And it is only in that atmosphere of honest dialogue that I can be objective. Only, only in that case can we be talking about an authentic and deep formation. It is essential to firm accompaniers in the style of Jesus. And I always think about the the dis disciples of uh, Emmaus, uh, when I talk about this, how does Jesus accompany the disciples of Emmaus? And this applies very much uh, to the service of authority. So it's for all of you, Mother Generals. Firstly, Jesus becomes present on the journey of the two in Emmaus. There's no distant accompaniment. We know that the general exists, but we never see her or the provincial. We never see her or the formator who are so many kilometers away. No, the journey has to be shared, the efforts and the joys. Secondly, Listen and provoke. Probably Jesus uh, knew. However, he asks, what are you talking about? You have to provoke. Have them speak. Be careful about those uh, formators uh, who, who say, I know what is happening to you, and they start prescribing. The only thing that's achieved is that the other one is going to withdraw. Well, since you know it all, why should I speak? But uh, the superiors also fall into this attitude. Before saying, I know what's wrong with you, let us listen, because we may be mistaken, and then provoke, ask questions so that the other can open up. Then we have to give reason about the following of Christ. Jesus explains the scriptures, gives reasons for the accompaniment. Didn't you know that? A further step forward. We have to bring them Jesus, Jesus, not the general sister, not the provincial, not the formator, because once again, this creates dependency. We have to bring them Jesus because he is the only true formator. We're just mediators. And he is the one who's going to offer the possibility to give the appropriate answer. I'm always struck when I read these texts. Jesus never told them, you have to go back to Jerusalem. Never. He put them in the condition so that they would give a free answer and run back to Jerusalem. Please. Do not give 
vocational responses in the place of four me's or sisters. Like a young person may come with some vocational doubts. It's very easy to say, I know you have a vocation. Who told you? Who's told you? But then what happens? When some uh, sister or brother asks for a dispensation from the vows, it will the, it will not be the first or last who will say, "I didn't make I didn't make my profession." The formator or the superior did this profession, so now the superior or formator should take responsibility. Let's imitate uh, Jesus. Let's copy Jesus. He's the only one we should be copying. Another characteristic is participation. I'm not going to extend myself because I already said that all those involved in the process have to participate. The more, the better, because what two eyes do not see, four eyes might see, and if four eyes don't see it, perhaps eight will. So participation, involvement. And then I'm going to accelerate so that I stay within the time. Another element along the process is listening to reality. In formation, the reality is our own, one's own. It is, one should not complete the formation process without knowing oneself. That is why the first question we need to answer in formation is, who am I? just to make sure that a person whom I do not know is the one that ends up uh, making his profession. The review or the reading of our personal reality and the reality of the Institute, please do not hide the problems that an Institute could have because they will find out. So naturally, as St. Paul says, we feed the kids with a little lighter foods, but we have to feed them all the same. So the reality of the Institute, then social, political reality of the men and women of our time, let us form based on reading and, and um, reading and sharing the community, then conversion. If we do not form, um, Based on reality, we're just uh, hitting air with uh, some sticks. Then conversion, I already said this, conversion of the people. We have to follow the process of change of people, as well as the process of change in the institutions. Perhaps we are using formation methods that do not apply today. They brought fruits in my times or in your times, but not today. So we might have to change what needs to change. The Pope told us very often that the synodal process has to lead to a change in church structures in consecrated life. Then another attitude is discernment. Here, please, let us discern discern vocations uh, in the best way possible. It seems now that we're all have, we all have a disorderly appetite for vocations. And if I can steal a vocation from the next door, next door community, well, that's not a sin. I may steal it because with everything it contains, at least let's ask for reports if someone comes from another institute. Let us ask for reports. I recently met um, a young woman. She was for monastic life. She came from four monasteries, one that I know very well, and she was expelled. There, there had to be a reason. Let us not open the door to the first person that comes calling. Please, discernment and discern formators. Sometimes I say that it's best to not have formators than having some formators. Sometimes we appoint formators who are 
in a voca undergoing a vocational crisis. So what are they going to sow? Crisis. And then we are afraid if they leave, it'd be very important to, do, to run statistics of a formator, formators who left consecrated life while there were formators serving as formators. I have two more minutes left. I have the device here. So to conclude, the church, just as consecrated life are synodal by nature, so synodality is part of the deep of its deepest identity formation, cannot do without this aspect of synodality. But for this to be possible, we have to keep in mind that synodality is only possible uh, with an atmosphere of uh, listening, dialogue, trust, peace, and freedom. Freedom is another word that scares us. We cannot demand responsibilities from our young people, and not only young people, unless we provide freedom unless we give them freedom. This is what is expected of consecrated life and formation for consecrated life. And I'd like to finish with a text from uh, Ageo. When everything was destruction, Ageo animated the, the rebuilding of the Temple of Jerusalem. And one of its uh, expressions is the following, uh, hands to work, sisters, the times that we had to experience are delicate, as John Paul II said. They are tough, as, uh, as uh, Teresa of Jesus said, but they're beautiful. So let us not cross our arms. The future of consecrated life uh, lies in formation, but a formation that is appropriate in a synodal key. That is why I conclude precisely on time and I say, let's get to work. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Monsignor Carvalho, for this uh, enriching manner of uh, of uh, exposing uh, this integration between synodality and formation as a process as a as a path uh, this change of mentality it's about how to keep trinity in mind to live this communion it is about how difference enriches us and we have to know how to know ourselves. We speak of the four me's, but this applies to all of us to start from our personal reality, the reality we have to experience now, the reality of our institutions. Everything that uh, he said about accompaniment, about walking, about setting out on a path to not stay immobile, in order to discern, know how to listen deeply and not take anything for granted. I think that this confirms everything we've been hearing and grow in this inner freedom in order to experience this integration and involvement of all, of everyone, just as the church wants to experience this as people of God. This um, ecclesiology from Vatican II is resurfacing with much strength. A church, people of God, where we all occupy a space and information, we are all responsible. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sisters. So now we will take some time in silence to allow what we've heard 
to seep into our being. And as usual, we have a question to help guide your reflections. And the question for this afternoon is, to what transformation of formation are we called to facilitate a more prophetic expression of synodality in religious life? So to what transformation of formation are we called to facilitate a more prophetic expression of synodality in religious life? We will take, yes, the, the question is on the screens now in English and in Spanish. So the, to what transformation of formation are we called to facilitate a more prophetic expression of synodality in religious life? So we will take about seven minutes quiet time and then we will have table conversation for 20 minutes. But we will let you know when to begin the table conversation. So seven minutes in silence to reflect.
So you are now invited to table conversation for 20 minutes. And Recording in progress.
Recording in progress. No se escucha, hermana. No hay audio. Sorry, sorry for the sound. It's a quarter past 20 minutes. Quarter past four, 20 minutes break. I'm writing it, 20 minutes break. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Enregistrer sous sur ton sur ton voilà c'est clair moi aussi ok alors vas-y vas-y vas Alors, voilà, c'est que ça, c'est les aussi. Oui, il y a la Si tu mettais la, 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 la stanza, si. Grazie, meglio, meglio, meglio. Meglio. Alors, qui, qui me dit c'est quoi l'eau Le coréano. C'est facile, là. C'est facile. <rire> Et pourquoi on dit des difficultés Alors, coréen, talk to French. To French, uh, to English, allez, on s'en fiche. Oui. Euh, on va copier, on va copier le numéro. Attends, on va se tranquille à la fin. Zoom. Ah, fier. Je l'ai pris, ça, je pense que c'est 20, 20 minutes de break, je pense. Ok, metti qui metti automatico qui. Ah. Coreano, coreano, vedi. Devo dare una. Metti metti break. Sì. Sì. Allora. Tu peux m'aider là parce que moi avec les il y a des tickets en poste.
Hello, Proby, Adeline, Teresita, hola. I'm, I'm very good, I'm in Rome. Oui, c'est ça. Je vais, je vais essayer de voir... Uh... Si, sí. hasta, hasta tres horas. Ok, Sí. Yo voy a construir el translator. Si, ça marche. Ok, ok. Alors, ça marche. Pourquoi ça marche pas chez les gens euh... Alors, je vais réessayer. Si. Je, vais, je vais retaper. Il doit y avoir. Alors, ça c'est. Bon, ça c'est autre chose. Je vais réessayer. Je vais réessayer l'autre. Je vais réessayer l'autre. Le. Ah ah. Alors, bon. Je vais essayer le. Wow, next is it. Wow. Je vous adore, mais le lien marche pas plus que les autres. Okay. De nouveau. Ah non, ça fonctionne. Non, ben, euh, excusez, j'ai 25 non. personnes qui sont là. Deux, deux, deux slash ici. C'est pas un seul slash. The, the real state. Mm -hmm. Il y a un espace. 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 Il y a un Il y a un espace. Il y a un Il y a un espace. 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 Il Milton. Wow. Parce que quand il y a la pause, tout le monde vient là et je suis toute seule. Alors elles envoient ça, ça ne marche pas. Et, et, right. 
A couple of questions, okay? Is what is the man's name? That's not Milton. The the, the student's name. No, no. What is his name? The student, the former student. Okay, it's okay. Oh, wow. C'est vrai, c'est vrai, c'est vrai, c'est vrai, c'est vrai, c'est vrai. 
Ça va Dans une action. Avec non. Oui, mais ça va mieux que le premier jour. Mais on a des soucis là, avec le, le drive, mais sinon ça va bien. Non, non, non. Oui, 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 oui. oui, oui. Nous, nous remercions vraiment ta disponibilité. Si nous avons un souci, alors... Oui, oui. Non, non, mais on est là. Si tu en es trois, mais... Marie, elle est toujours... Moi, j'appelle toi. Non, non, mais on est trois pour ça. Si tu veux, maintenant, on est trois. Donc, euh... non, mais on est là. Non, mais on n'est pas tout... Enfin, si tu es à l'Assemblée, là, je... les gens, ils m'écrivent. Je dis non, là, je ne peux pas. Vous savez qu'il y avait l'Assemblée. Je ne peux pas. Mais sinon, on n'est pas, pas pris tous les trois. Et on est là pour ça, hein. on est là pour aider les congrégations. Non, il faut absolument que les congrégations, elles se, elles se mettent de plus en plus. Sinon, sinon euh, tout va, toutes les rencontres vont être comme ça maintenant. Non, il faut qu'on apprenne. Il faut qu'on apprenne. Nous aussi, on apprend. Hein. Les techniciens aussi, ils apprennent. Parce que c'est le début, c'est la première fois. Non, non, on essaye de... On essaye de de oui, faire ça. Oui, oui, il faut apprendre. Oui, oui. Non, non. Tu es là pour quelques jours Oui, Alors, oui, oui.
Mientras van llegando, por favor, ahora les pedimos si pueden ayudarnos a encontrar unos lentes. Unos lentes más color más o menos lila. Están perdidos unas gafas o lentes, como, como se, se dice. Si, si las han visto, por favor, las pueden so, traer por aquí. We would like to... Mientras se van, eh, nos vamos. Eh, As we sit around our table, I have an announcement for the sisters from the conferences of Africa. They want to meet at the end of today's sessions around table 62. If uh, from some region or country the delegate has not uh, come, is not attending, please a representative from the country join in this uh, meeting around table 62. This uh, meeting is for the presidents of the conferences of Africa table 62 at the end of today after six, please. Tu as le chat, t'inquiète, tu peux y répondre.
arrivano un attimo in bagno. Ci si lascia il libro per me. Bien, vamos a, a prepararnos para seguir en esta. We're going to get ready to continue in this attitude of uh, listening, of being attentive to everything that happens during our conversations when we listen to the people who are enriching us through their wisdom and experience. Just to say that you saw that the first day Yolanda was seated at this table yesterday and today Franca was here. Today we have Monica with us. And every day, not all of them can, but those who are members of the executive committee of the USG, all of us want to spend a day here. This morning, there was Regina, who's part of the executive, to at least give a face to the sisters who have been walking all together. So we invited uh, Jesse and our sister Natalie here so that they too can um, listen to what comes from their sharing, from the sharing around the tables. Before we begin our sharing, we're going to devote some time to look, to look, but beyond seeing. We're going to contemplate this. To look at what this company, this group, Pataleta, offers through the images that um, collect what we have been experiencing. They will, we're just going to contemplate them. We we'll just let these images touch us. This is a way of um, recalling what we are experiencing. So now they're going to project these images.
Bien. Ahora nos vamos a ayudar de, de los números que se han... We are now going to, uh, to be assisted by the numbers on the microphones. If you look at the microphones, we have numbered the microphones. Here on my right, there's a one. On my left, there's a two. Then three is uh, at the end of the hall. Yes, and on this side, we have four. Because yes, Third day, we were a little confused about who would speak. This is helpful. So we invite you right now to say what we have heard today. This morning, this afternoon, around the tables, let us uh, take a moment of silence. three minutes of silence to collect what we've heard. And then I will invite you to speak up, to walk to the microphones and speak. Las invito ahora a prepararse. I now invite you to prepare yourselves. If anybody wishes to start sharing, you can approach or walk up to microphone number one, two, three. We're going to follow a sequence, keeping in mind that we also have the sisters online and that at uh, some point we will ask if the sisters who are <clears throat> attending online want to give a contribution. So 
those who want to walk up to a microphone will just be attent attentive. You just walk up to the one that is closest to you and we will call you by microphone number. Okay, you are approaching two microphones. We're going to go to number one first and then number three. Thank you very much for have granting me the floor. I'm Sister Clementine, uh, Mary Immaculate of Mary from RDC Congo. I'm really touched by the uh, comments on uh, formation and synodality. I have uh, now underlined listening. And as a leader, I am called to listen to formators and formants. Quite often, we base ourselves on, uh, for, on formators, and we do not uh, pay attention to people in formation, to formators. And often, when there is a problem, we normally tend to say, uh, here we don't do this. This is how we do things, and you are the one who who, is, um, who has to adapt to our way of doing in our congregation. Thank you, the sister at number three from table forty-one. My name is Landy Oblate of Jesus. Uh, from Mexico, we have a lot to resonate with since the morning. The question about what is the new that we discovered to walk in the synodality. We mentioned the importance of making room for the newness of the spirit because we are anchored to the past the styles of reading reality and discerning. Sometimes we lose track of the newness in the spirit, God and the same God, the same history, but in a different key. That's what we're invited to. We also resonated very much with when to speak and when to stay silent. Sometimes our silence makes us lose our intuition and we do not share our word. Or sometimes we speak very immediately without allowing some time to the process of silence in order to um, say the, a word from the gospel, the issue of hospitality that we've lost a lot, not just about uh, feeding or opening up the house, but a space uh, within our, uh, our life. And I think that is more difficult. And also about uh, the question about what confirmations that we get on our synodal path. Well, the importance of uh, meetings, encounters, accompaniment, compassionate attention, solidarity. And we said that in new generations, uh, the religious uh, bond uh, is a little better because they are more used to it because since we are less, we have more spaces to for encounter in religious life and the elderly sisters have more difficulties. So we see that the ties, the bonds, intercongregational, inter these are the, this is the new. And we also recognize that when we embrace our vulnerability, this has led us to walk together. We have opened up to other institutes to walk together. Then as far as the implications for formation, we, what resonated is to have formation that comes out of its self-reference, uh, wanting to put in order to transmit this charism down to the core of the formies, we become self-referential. Then the change of logic, of logic, going from the logic of the world to the gospel, from uh, having to being, possessing to giving. And we said when we talk about uh, religious life, we could say about us uh, leaving everything they followed. And then now they say that when we change houses, taking everything, they went. And we shouldn't uh, hide or 
put makeup over the wrinkles and learn to embrace the wrinkles of our institutions. Do not be afraid of embracing this vulnerability. The part about provoking, provoking the formies and not just to those in initial formation, but all of them provoke to get out of the community and uh, uninstall ourselves. The importance of transforming ongoing formation ongoing formation, at least around our table, we see that it has weakened a lot. The sisters feel that they are already formed and they want no more. New generations are more formed as far as the interreligious aspect. And we should recover the style of Jesus to truly be prophetic, the importance of a profile and the formator with a prophetic and synodal style. And sometimes we postpone problematic uh, situations instead of having a real formation processes. This is what the table wanted to share. Microphone number four, please. I am a Franciscan of Mary de la Montagne. Well, I speak French, but I have a Canadian accent from Quebec, Quebec. Well, what remains with me over these three days is that synodality was repeated today in the afternoon. Synodality of the third millennium. Well, for the church is maybe not something special, but uh, it's a process. This word process, I heard so many times it was repeated in the afternoon, but I would say it's a way of journeying together. So therefore, this implies a transformation which uh, somehow um, imposes us to abandon every kind of uh, uh, prejudice or to pretend uh, owing the truth and then to launch and to en enjoy a true dialogue to journey together. And among the fruits which do allow us to identify and understand if I am truly engaged in a synodal path, because it is a process, this word is, well, it was clear. I wonder what to really we need, not so much to change, but to transform uh, and transform ourselves in order to live with joy the the seeds and their fruits. I really enjoyed very much this morning that speech on wisdom. And wisdom, I heard with this uh, presentation in a completely different way. Wisdom more as a way of being engaged, a way of living, a lifestyle where wisdom becomes truly a, a, a tool, um, a tool uh, and a support to journey in synodality. But, you know, in wisdom, there are always two tensions. On the one hand, you tend to remain rooted and clinging to your history, to your past, uh, to your tradition, because it is uh, important, just like a tree, which has its uh, roots. But let's not forget that God does a lot of new things. So at the top of the uh, tree, you have these green sprouts and we have them they're beautiful the ones that we have now in spring in canada and quebec so we have to remain connected um, at the both ends on the one hand at the roots but also with an eye and with a look at the top of our tree because there are many new things which are sprouting my heart is full of uh, hope in this church which i love and in this church that i feel is undergoing a new transformation and uh, I would say in a completely unique uh, historical moment. Thank you sisters. We now go to microphone number two and then number one. I'm Sister Catherine from the Dominican Sisters in Germany. I have been touched in the presentation. It was talked about consecration, consecration 
uh, in our German language, we don't say consecrated life. We only consecrate the host in the Eucharist. And now it touched me to hear that word consecration in connection with religious life. And that touched me very much and uh, was thought provoking for me. And the second thing that touched me, I, I have asked priests, what do you do with the synodal way? And they, these priests told me, well, I don't know. I haven't heard about it. It doesn't happen in my place. And, and I also heard at my table that some bishops try to ignore this synodal way. And I'm so grateful to the UISG that they don't ignore it, that they take it up and promote it. The sister at microphone one and then the sister at microphone number four. Thank you. So, Sister Madeleine Franciscan, I am at table 59. We have discovered that you have to give hospitality if you want to receive it. Take time, one time to listen and time to speak. Listen and discern. Choose the path of resistance, of nonviolent resistance and faith. Act and not simply know about theory, but translate that. And then what we have to let go, be focused on uh, present times, be open, open-minded, accepting what is good and, and embracing with courage the future. We, we have the image of a woman who is uh, watering in order to, uh, to, to fight against uh, adversities for the well-being of uh, his or her family. And therefore, we have to seed even in, uh, we have to keep seeding all the time throughout our entire life. And we are the image of a woman who has the true hope that everything will be done and will be succeed with the grace of God. And this invites us and calls us to invite God to grant us wisdom so that with his spirit, we can discern and ful in discerning fulfill his uh, call. A lot has been said on formation and we would like to ask and invite call the lord and ask the lord to inspire us because as recently it has been said our formators remain in their institutes for many years they leave the institute um, many after many years as uh, members thank you sister number four then I don't know whether there will be someone on Zoom, Florence. Italian, my name is Sister Sabrina, sister of the House of Nazareth. We were asked a question today, what can contribute a religious life to the synodal process. I believe much, actually. We have a lot of expertise in that. But I would also like to highlight the fact that we can also focus on the margins, on people who are voiceless. I would like to bring about an experience of one of my sisters who are who is part of the team organizing the synodal tables to collect the voices of the church. She actually organized many institutional tables uh, of politicians, of entrepreneurs, uh, and also in parishes. And then we actually compared information concerning some peculiar tables. She actually organized some tables at which she invited very easygoing people who are part of our Christian communities or just go to mass when there are funerals. Uh, 
but also tables for young gays and lesbians for LGBTQE communities, because it is important to listen to everyone's voice. And I believe that we, as religious women, we can create this bridge between those who are not listened to in the church and those who must listen in the church. Thank you very much. We're going to now go to the sister who is standing at microphone three. I am table 47. Sister Pascaline uh, Theresian. I come from the Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm really touched from the very beginning of this assembly. Our table was wondering, we thought that we were going to speak about uh, vulnerability of others, of the poor people who are in struggle, who are affected by the pandemics one instead we were encouraged from the very first day to think about and speak about our vulnerability so we are vulnerable and we have to start from our vulnerability before looking at the vulnerability of others we were very much surprised and we have spoken about that quite extensively now Often, we're often uh, side by side, but we are not uh, there for the other, because in our religious community, we are together, but we are not there for the other. And at times, we are not even there for the people of God, but only for ourselves, while synodality is inviting us to go towards the other, to be open to talk to the other. And so thinking about formation, what are the implications of synodality? Form, form uh, to liberty, form to learn to know each other, so to come to grasps with ourselves, because often we try to form an ideal religious woman instead of uh, forming a true religious person first of all who knows herself and often we are not able to recognize ourselves and uh, as regards uh, hope i was really touched because at times we, we are just like uh, widows we are like, just like women who are crying for their husbands who have died. We are sad, we are unable to smile, we're unable to be the source of joy. I should be the messenger of joy and of the grace of God. And may the Lord help us to become light at the top beacons so that we as uh, fellow sisters and seeing us sad, they have to instead uh, find the joy to live and may we find the synodality. And I believe that synodality and formation are the same because they both require transformation. Thank you. I don't know whether we have uh, participation uh, by Padlet or nothing, okay. If uh, there, let's wait until we. Good afternoon. I speak on behalf of Table Forty in Spanish. My name is Amelia Encarnacion. I'm a religious of the Apostolate of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. The meeting in general is being very rich, very deep, very synodal. Today, uh, as we try to highlight the points that resonated in the group, we saw this wisdom associated to the woman as far as uh, being attentive uh, to life, uh, trying to see where God is present, where the Lord is passing, it opens us to 
vulnerability to recognize vulnerability, but also a vulnerability that invites us to create communion, dialogue, listening, hospitality. It also seemed very important to have that gaze that uh, goes to the horizon to, to discover where God is passing that the newness, that the contemplative uh, amazement. And this um, dialectics about a past, this terminology about a past with some roots that are essential in our life, but with an openness that provides us with wings to respond to what the Lord is asking for, to the newness of the spirit. And this attitude of uh, listening, this attitude of discernment, that discernment where everyone has a word. And as each, everyone says what the spirit is inspiring, what we ultimately choose, we are led to something that is new, something that uh, emerges to put that synodality in common. In the afternoon, we said that everything dealing with formation is a huge challenge today. There are some essential traits that give an identity to our being consecrated, our following of Christ. But at the same time, we are invited to a formation that has to open, open us to freedom, to listening, to discernment. Uh, caring for what is essential in this following of Christ, but based on reality and on what the world is asking for. So this corresponds to what we saw this morning, uh, rooting and wings. Essentially, we saw how essential a formation community is. Discernment somehow has to go through a community where we can discover together where the Lord is leading us. Every sister, every for me, we see what every sister and for me are achieving. It is not on a personal level. It is sent by a community. So that's, that's what we think it is important and that we have to keep. Internationality, that richness of charisms, that uh, helps us open up further. It is an experience of the spirit well, where everyone contributes a flavor, the flavor of the religious family. But with the others, with my sisters and brothers, we are being enriched. And the same openness to the life of the laity who share a same charism, as a charismatic family based on their vocation. And we also saw a challenge, a challenge to reread and review religious life uh, today with regard to the theology of the vows, ecclesiology. It is um, a perspective on today's world, to today's reality, but deeply rooted in God. So there's a challenge there to ensure that all of this uh, leads us uh, to continue following the God with depth, but with a look on synodality. Today, again, uh, around our table, a deep gratitude emerged uh, for uh, WISC around our table because uh, the uh, during the pandemic, this was an awakening of the spirit. All these uh, formation processes you're offering, the financial help uh, that you have provided. I mean, there's been such a beautiful response from UISG, the entire UISG, and we are deeply grateful. We mentioned this yesterday, but we wanted to repeat this again because we mentioned it around our table. We are very deeply grateful because we're truly on a synodal path. We were saying that UISG, I mean, the pandemic has offered UISG the opportunity to enter even more 
deeply into our communities and congregations. So thank you so much to UISG and to everyone for, for such a synodal meeting. Thank you. We're going to listen to our sister at microphone one and then the sister at microphone three. First, number one. Table number 76, Sister Irene, we were talking about the fact and we were reflecting about the fact that when we talked about vulnerability, we only thought, we only thought and talked from the, an external point of view, but we discovered that we have many vulnerability inside of us in our interior and many vulnerabilities emerged at my table and we embrace vulnerability with curiosity, with uncertainty as well. But this is also a form of blocking our securities. And so it is probably better to cultivate research and looking for the possibility of not blocking uh, our vulnerabilities in order not to be rigid when we share our mission and when we are recognized as those important and good and demanding sisters and when we see a sister maybe playing or smiling this actually creates confusion and amazement in others. And we were saying that wise women, wise sisters dance and sing about their stories of liberation. It is important to cultivate this joy among us and in the formation. Change occurs not through force or violence. And even our relationship actually grows and develops in formation when we are humane, when we have our mission, our work, but when we are able to live the joy of consecration. Thank you very much. We're now going to listen to our sister at microphone number three, and then we're going to listen to two contributions from our sisters uh, via Zoom. St. Joseph of Cluny. I'm from Sierra Leone, but I live in France. I'm not going to talk on behalf of my table, but I was encouraged by my table to share a personal story, which I shared with them. So for me, I think the importance of remembering that when we are accompanying people in formation, the importance of being humane and of um, remembering that we are accompanying human beings is something that is, was a, uh, was, I was reminded of very, very powerfully today. And the idea that formation is not about me, it's about accompanying people on the way towards um, Jesus, towards Jerusalem. I shared a story of how I came in touch with a particular area of vulnerability that I was not aware of, vulnerability in my own life. I was 39 when I was um, named novice mistress and I cried for three days. I felt as if I had been called to go into a cage. I told my provincial I don't mind giving good example, but I hate having to do it. So I went to the novitiate with a lot of reluctance and resistance. One day, I asked one of the novices to do something. I think it was to sweep cobwebs or something. And an hour later, I came back. She hadn't done it and she was doing something that I considered not to be very important. And I scolded her very strongly. I raised my voice and I said a lot of things. And when I turned around, I saw a sister coming towards me. She used to come and visit us and we'd have a cup of tea together. She was the novice mistress of the sisters of St. Joseph of Annecy, Sister Angela. I think she died a couple of years ago. 
This was in the Gambia. And I was ashamed when I saw Sister Angela because she heard me shouting. So I said to her, I'm not, I'm not going to let them get the better of me. And she puts her hand on my shoulder and she said, they are not trying to get the better of you. These are young women looking for a bit of love and compassion. It was like a bolt of lightning for me. And it was a moment of profound change because that was when I realized on reflection that I was on the defensive and that I was afraid maybe that I wasn't good enough, not holy enough. I don't know what it was, but I was afraid. And I certainly wasn't up to what I was supposed to be. And I can tell you that from that moment on, I changed and everything changed in that novitiate. And my relationship with the novices became much warmer, much more human, because I became more humane and more real and natural with them. And to this day, I can consider that those novices who passed through um, that time, that today they are, we are all very good friends. So it was one of the turning points in my life. And it's one of the, the things that convinced me that when we are real, when we show, we, act, we embrace our vulnerability and um, we are truly human, then we can make much stronger connections. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias, hermana. Vamos a escuchar. Thank you, sister. We're going to listen to the contributions online and then we're going to give the floor here. Good afternoon, good uh, morning, the Spanish speaking group. During the first uh, group, we were struck by the relation between wisdom and hospitality, the celebrative dimension as uh, women to take care of the shoots, to be able to know when to speak, when to stay silent also the balance between uh, respecting, uh, appreciating, being faithful, and the fidelity to the continuous newness of God that promotes the story of salvation. And also we were struck by asking faithfully without, uh, without doubting. Second group about formation and synodality, the cause we heard, we felt was the need to update formation and all its stages and especially ongoing formation in response to the invitations of the spirit and to the needs of God's people that we all are. On the other hand, the ecclesial path of synodality is an opportunity, a blessing to renew religious life and its presence in the world and also formation to walk together, to listen, to have a dialogue, processes of, of conversion, to approach the church of brothers and sisters in the style of Jesus. Synodality is a path that trains us to live in fraternal communion in the world. And in our group, we were also very thankful to USG for its efforts, closeness for becoming present when, when everything seemed so dark and that has made us all more flexible and agile. And uh, thank you. Now, yes, there's another sister. Hello, I am Franciscan uh, sister of Mary from Syria. I simply would like to uh, share and express my joy also on behalf of my institute. Since this morning, that hope is... Uh, growing in me because after eight years of conflict and of war 
the situation is maybe uh, evolving. I feel a bit of a, a bit of hope. And I really have drawn a lot from all that has been said. And since this morning, I'm thinking about Abraham, who has obeyed at the call, at God's call. He left. He left to go to a land uh, that he was inheriting, but without having an idea of where he was going. And I can see that image. I visualize that image before me. I think we are now journeying all together, together with the church, together with uh, our institute, and together with all of the congregations along this uh, path of transformation, which will turn us to become more human, more welcoming, open, able to listen, to accept and embrace the world, and whoever is uh, surrounding us, and whatever is happening in our world. So open to all this. I would say that this path of uh, agricultural transformation work, which implies a local uh, work, but also a community co community work. And so in order to reach this kind of result, we have to necessarily allow for this personal transformation, which will allow us to see uh, God incarnated in our lives. Thank you very much. I think there's another sister online who wants to participate, yes? that I, I am living the synod in a completely new way. It's like I'm on retreat. And it's really very, very profound. When I think of when you talk about listening, going deep inside at three o'clock in the morning, it's a lot easier than during the day we're sitting with 500 people. And yet, I feel so very close and so connected to everything that I'm hearing in that room in Rome. I want to say that for me, this is a new experience. We as religious have been gifted with the chance to live in synod in everyday life. And my challenge is how can I create spaces like this especially with the lay people in our parishes. We, we, I think we have a gift to pass on to others and I feel very challenged by this. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, sisters. Thank you to each and every one of you for sharing the wisdom that is emerging. We're now going to ask Dr. Jesse, our sister, Natalie and Monsignor Carvalho, to say something, just three minutes, about what they heard. Three minutes each to tell us something that is resonating from what they heard. Thank you. Thank you. Am I allowed to be less than three minutes? What, what I've been hearing 
so, so strongly um, this evening, but also in other conversations that I've been, um, I've been in, has convinced me that synodality is not a new thing that religious sisters have to learn that I have just been so struck that becoming synodal is simply about going deeper and more authentically into what you already are and what you are already called to be. Um, as um, I, I don't like the term lay person, but as a, as a lay person, I am so, so encouraged. Um, if, if I'm and I am sometimes feel anxious about the church and her future. Well, what I'm hearing has given me a profound sense of peace and of joy. And just really knowing that there is such a powerhouse throughout the world, so many different charisms, so many different, um, th th there's, so many, there's so many different expressions and yet, Religious sisters are such a gift of God to the church at this time. And if I can just say it again, it's not about, okay, let's find a different way of being. It's about embracing who you are, what you have always called, been called to be, what you are already doing in, in a way that um, I don't think I've seen it anywhere before. Um, and, yeah, and that God really is going to be using you um, and working through you to bring such life and such hope throughout the world. Yes, yes. Pour ma part, uh, so personally, what uh, stays with me and which really touched me is to listen, to notice, to contemplate with you a way of journeying, a way of uh, journeying together, which is well incarnated. I was really moved and touched by how each of you is forged by your reality. Well, for example, the last... Uh, uh, sister who was speaking about Syria after eight years of conflict, another voice which um, uh, transmits another reality, another international reality. And what is really touching me and what is really remaining with me and moving me is the way of looking at world through the Holy Spirit, which is not simply doing some little maquillage, but which is instead is uh, recognizing the difficulties and the struggles, but from the inside, in a very realistic and also in a very uh, prophetic way of journeying together. And I think that this is what we are experiencing here, which is a true uh, gift. And this is what we are living here. Is, we cannot uh, basically do that uh, now, but it's a way of sharing since uh, the true the true challenge is not only a, the, the synod, but to become a synod. We all have to become a synodal sister. A superior a synodal superior general and this conversion to synodality which is god's call is not something we can do in two days three days or maybe one or two years it is certainly going to take longer but i that's a, is true but also in these interpersonal uh, is that not everything is easy some say that uh, this process cannot be done, there is resistance, there are bishops. This is all of this is true. And it is also normal because every change uh, is, um, at every change, there is a form of resistance. It's part of the experience of our lives. However, what we are called to do is to continue. And uh, I would say that uh, everything echoes with this last uh, sentence of the preparatory document of the Synod, which we are living uh, 
and that I live with you at least. And so the goal of the Synod, uh, but it's not to simply produce uh, documents, but to um, elaborate uh, visions, uh, hope, uh, stimulate uh, and encourage uh, trust, uh, to heal wounds, uh, network, and weave relationships, open up a new dawn, uh, learn from each other, and to create a positive uh, um, imagination and to re-giving force to our human beings. And also there were others, which I, sorry if I missed a couple, but um, all of this remains with me. First of all, thank you so much for your sharing. That is very rich uh, with, based on the personal experiences as well as your experiences around your tables. What strongly resonated in me at this time is the need to embrace vulnerability. It's true that it is the the theme of your meeting, but this makes me think and underline that uh, information, we need to embrace our vulnerability first, reconcile with our own history to then be able to embrace the vulnerability of, the, of others. We cannot think that the candidates who are coming up to us or the sisters given by God are perfect because we are not either. So that is why it is urgent for me to learn, to embrace vulnerability that is specific to me in order to then embrace the other's vulnerability. What resonated with me again is the need for community discernment. And this at the level of initial formation, but also ongoing formation. I honestly think that consecrated life does not need to invent any synodal structures. It is synodal in itself, and it has many synodal structures, but they have to work as such. For instance, the general superior always always has a council. There is a synodal structure there, if we do it right. The province has a council. Every house has a council. So creativity is not so much about inventing synodal structures, rather to give life to the synodal structures uh, that exist in consecrated life and that sometimes don't work. So discernment in initial and ongoing formation in the community as a fraternity listening to each other and you who for the most part are general superiors, I, uh, I am convinced that the ministry of listening is the first ministry that is asked of you because there are very many sisters or brothers who live in deep solitude. And this takes away joy from consecrated life. Then I very much like the something that was uh, underlined that I did not hear wisdom as hospitality this is very biblical i suppose that the contributor kept in mind of the bible data but it's very biblical there is no wisdom without hospitality welcoming the other especially in his or her diversity we spoke about that a lot but it is difficult to accept diversity and in consecrated life, we have to accept that even if 
especially if we look at this assembly that I suppose perfectly reflects the world consecrated life. We live a reality that is marked by universality firstly and by multiculturality that is not multicultural. It, it should be multicultural. I'd like to conclude saying, please, and I'm telling this uh, to feminine consecrated life, as I would tell the men, let's not be prophets uh, of uh, of bad uh, of bad news. It's true that we have uh, many dark sides, but there's a lot of holiness of uh, sanctity. Let's look at the positive side. And the Pope on February 2nd, 2013, asked us, the consecrated uh, people, to not be prophets of misadventure. It's true that there are many exits, abandonments, too many, close to 2,000 every year, but there's a lot of faith still. And I conclude simply inviting us to dream together, to work together to work on projects together and to and being very thankful to the feminine consecrated life for everything it is and for everything it does especially in this area of embracing vulnerability and please rely on the congregation where i've been working for the last nine years to help you along this path of creative fidelity thank you Thank you all. We're going to continue with some announcements. Well, no, no, very important. We're going to we're going to prepare for tomorrow for the audience with the Pope. So we thank. We thank Natalie, Jesse, Monsignor Carballo, and we invite Patricia Morgante and Pat so they can help us prepare for tomorrow. Now, let us prepare with some practical information for the audience of tomorrow, which is confirmed at 11 o'clock. For those who want to participate in the Mass, you will find information on places and timetables in your padlet for the program, in your booklet. At the all poll the sixth, you can enter from nine o'clock onwards. We would like to ask you not to come too early, from nine o'clock onwards. So here, Google Earth, is going to help us to find the all for those who don't know it. So crossing Via della Conciliazione, turn on the left and follow the path along St. Peter's, St. Peter's Square to come to the entrance of Aula Paolo VI, Paul VI Hall. There you can show your badge and then you can enter the hall. It is not possible to enter without your badge. So if any one of you 
superior generals still don't have it, please come to me. However, for speakers and others, they can contact the secretariat at the first floor. If you have any problem at the entrance, I would like to ask Sister Therese to show the, the WhatsApp number of UISG. Take note. We will be very attentive to your text messages. If you are there and they will not let you enter, please write us. So now I'm going to leave the floor to Sister Pat for further information. Thank you, Patrizia. In the original uh, outline of the program, you may remember that it said, lunch at your own convenience. Now we're happy to announce that due to our wonderful sponsors, that we are offering lunch here to everybody tomorrow on return from the uh, audience. So lunch will, we're presuming the audience will last from 11 to maybe 12.30. So lunch will be served here beginning at a quarter to two, or if you come a little earlier, they will begin. So I'm encouraging all of you to make your way back here, uh, very near the exit when you come out of the gates of the Paul the Sixth Hall to the left, if you walk over that small area, there's a tunnel going down. Don't go down the tunnel. Uh, but in, in a sense, yes, if you go down that tunnel, you come out at the other side and there are taxis there. I'm suggesting that you share taxis and return here as soon as you can. You can also take the buses, those of you who are familiar with the buses from the side of St. Peter's. So it's just to say to you, lunch will start here from about 20 minutes to two, allowing for an hour to return. And then we take up our program tomorrow afternoon at around three o'clock. And it's a very important program in the afternoon. Because on the one hand, we are reporting on all that you have done in relation to care for our planet Earth, responding to Pope Francis's call, particularly through Laudato Si. And we are also looking together at the extraordinary work of Talitha Kum and the over more than 60 uh, groups worldwide of sisters and their collaborators who are tackling the scourge of human trafficking. Then that will be followed by a very important session from the commission, the joint commission on care and safeguarding and a report from the UISG's office for care and safeguarding. This is an area, if you remember last year, that we had a closed session to look at the challenges to, to religious life. This session tomorrow is, is an open session. So we are, we are giving an account of what we have done in response to what you uh, proposed and suggested three years ago. But we're also highlight, highlighting some of the emerging areas that we have to reflect on and look, look at together, particularly areas that are in the area of spiritual or psychological abuse of vulnerable adults. We will also 
in that final session, look at Catholic Care for Children International, which is our response at an international level to the whole question of moving from institutional care to family-based care. Uh, this is an area I feel particularly deeply about. Uh, as a sister from Ireland, and many of our congregations had institutional homes for orphans, orphans, unmarried mothers, and so on, and did the best they could with, we did the best we could with the resources we had at that time. But 30 and 40 years later, the work of the sisters is criticized. And the message often is, you should have known better. So we're responding to initiatives that are happening in the secular world to move from institutional care to really supporting family and keeping children in their families as much as possible. So this is an important topic that we need to reflect on together. So just to repeat, back for lunch as soon as you can. Lunch service will begin as soon as people begin to, to arrive at around quarter to two. And then we begin our afternoon session at three o'clock. Just a final word, those who will be getting COVID tests, either who ha which have been organized, please bring your passports with you because that's the documentation that's needed. I see Patricia hovering. Is there something else I need to say? Yeah, yeah. we will be conducting the test before three o'clock in a room here in order to get your results back in time. So that's just uh, an alert for tomorrow. Thank you very much indeed. Mm. After this um, important information, we invite Paula to help us conclude this day with a prayer. One, two, one, two, one, two. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. So we'll finish today with, with prayer. A sister before was saying that whoever sings and dances her own story is a wise person. So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to sing and dance our own story the story God does with us. And we'll start, we'll do it in English, as you can see. We'll start with our hymn. We haven't sung it for a while. So we'll start, please. Under your cross we stand, hearing the cry of your world. We can't get up. Our desire is to embrace the wants of humanity. 
can sit or you can stand if you want as you wish. Today as we um, journeyed in synodality and looked at religious life, we continue to look at Mary and Elizabeth. And both of them were able to perceive um, the wonders, the wonders of God. Monsignor Carvalho um, just told us that it's true there are many challenges, but it's true as well that there are many blessings. Elizabeth and Mary were able to recognize those blessings. Let us listen to what Elizabeth said and cried. In Luke 1, verse 42, Elizabeth gave a loud cry and said, Of all women, you are the most blessed, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Let us recognize the signs of blessing, of faith, of resurrection that are already around us in religious life, in our congregations, in the church, in this assembly in the world and in us. Let us ponder for a moment in those signs that we already, we already perceive. On your tables, you will find some ribbons, some colorful ribbons. I invite you, if you want to write one or two, or just to hold the ribbon in your hand, 
and think and pray about those signs. Feel free as well to write if you can write on them. A sign of blessing, of synodality, of resurrection, of faith that you already perceive. You can write if you want, or you can just hold that colorful ribbon in your hand, and we pray a little bit in silence. As we pray and as we write, I invite you to tie that sign onto your rope, that rope that means your life, your congregation, and as well the synodal path because the ropes are knotted together, they are tied up to each other. Not to the badge, to the ropes on the table. <laughs> yes. The ropes that are accompanying us all these days. We are still on a synodal journey. invite you again to hold those ropes with your hands and to contemplate that on those ropes we have our names, our congregations, our wounds, and also the signs of resurrection and synodality. And we contemplate those ropes as we continue to pray and try to make a bit of silence. In the path of life, we need to recognize the blessings, the signs of joy, of faith, of love, and we need to give thanks. We rejoice and give thanks in our hearts, in our own words, for the blessings that are among us. 
for the fruits of synodality that we already see in this assembly. For fulfilling our promise in mysterious ways. And for your presence in our lives, we thank God for his presence in our lives. We can thank him for many more of the blessings that we are experiencing within us. I invite you now in loud voice, whenever you feel, whenever you want in your own language, just to say thank you. And we can have a melody of thank yous this afternoon, this evening in this room. Obrigada. Thank you, Sia Bonga. <laughs> and giving thanks, we finish our prayer singing along with a video that sings, Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks.